بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Riaz Malik, Honorary Professor of Medicine and Consultant Physician at Central Manchester University Teaching Hospital and University of Manchester, former president of Neurodiabetes, the Diabetes Neuropathy Study Group of the AACD. Uh, Professor Malik will talk about DDP4 inhibitors. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. So, this is a, a, a Novartis sponsored symposium, but Novartis have nothing to do with the slides I'm going to present. In fact, I haven't even spoken to anybody from Novartis uh, about, so this is my, my views, my opinions of what we have at the moment in terms of therapies. So the title is DP4 inhibitors beyond um, glycemia. So if we look at therapies in diabetes, what is very clear is that in the world of hypertension, um, from around 1950 onwards, we've had successively, every five to 10 years, new therapies have come onto the market. And new therapies have come onto the market to help patients in terms of controlling blood pressure. However, in the world of blood glucose control, glycemia, what we have is actually insulin, which was actually started in the 1920s. But then, that's all we had, insulin. We then had, around the late 1950s, sulfonylureas and the biguanides. But the biguanide that we had was fenformin, which then, of course, was withdrawn because of lactic acidosis. And then we had actually nothing happened for a long period of time. And Life as a diabetologist was very simple because all we had is a few drugs, but then something happened. Um, around the mid 1990s, that has accelerated the number of medications that we now currently have available to treat our patients with diabetes. And I deliberately put XXX up there because I think there are many more new compounds that are going to come. One of those compounds is the DPP4 inhibitors. And we, of course, have the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP1 receptor agonists, which are currently available. So what else is it that's triggered this, I guess, need for newer therapies? Well, one of them actually is this. So this is a meta-analysis of trials that have been done to look at the effect of lowering glucose on cardiovascular outcomes. What does it show? Well, it shows you that the UK PDS, although not significant, perhaps showed that improving blood sugar in newly diagnosed type 2 diabetic patients might have a beneficial outcome but this was not significant. However, four other trials, three of them showed no benefit for lowering glucose compared to Accord, which actually showed that lowering glucose in our diabetic patients with the therapies we had previously could potentially do more harm, could increase the cardiovascular event rate. So this has led to a search, I think, for newer therapies. And the problem is this, that if you look at Accord, Advance, and VADT, you can see that cardiovascular mortality and mortality was increased by 22% and 39%. In Advance, no significant improvements, and in VADT, again, actually a significant, uh, no, non-significant, but an increase by 25%. So you're left with three major clinical trials which have asked the question, can we, by lowering glucose, make our patients have less heart attacks and live longer? And the conclusion of this study is no. So what is the problem? Well, Francis Bacon, many years ago, in fact, 500 years ago, said that the remedy is worse than the disease sometimes. 
So what was the remedy that was being used in these clinical trials? Well, I can tell you, at that time, it was predominantly metformin, sulfonylureas, thiazolidine diones, and insulin. There were really, none of the newer drugs were, on the, were being used at that time in those clinical trials, which was the Accord, the Advance, and the VADT trials. And what's very clear is that when you use these drugs, they lower glucose, but they don't improve outcomes. So there is something called an elephant in the room. What is the elephant in the room? The elephant in the room, ladies and gentlemen, is, is an old English idiom where there is an obvious truth that is being ignored or goes unaddressed, and it also applies to an obvious problem or risk no one wants to discuss. So, as a physician, I have these results, but at the same time, I have a patient in front of me who need, we need to lower glucose on. So what do we do? We carry on doing what we're doing, or we think of alternatives. So who is this? He was actually, I think, a very brave man because he took on Big Pharma and challenged what they were telling us. So do you know who this is? This is Steve Nissen, cardiologist from the Cleveland Clinic. And what he actually did is he was responsible for the loss of $12 billion from two major companies. And he did it by publishing two papers. Eleanor talked about clinical trials, about the importance of clinical research. Well, he published two papers. One paper was in JAMA in 2005, where he showed that Murray Glitazar, which was a, a thiazolidine dione combined, a PPAR alpha and a PPAR gamma agonist, actually caused excess cardiovascular events. And because of that, there was a loss of share value in the company by 2.4% and they lost 3 billion. The other major fatality that um, Steve Nissen was responsible for is rosiglitazone. So he again showed that rosiglitazone could be causing cardi excess cardiovascular events. And again, GSK market share value fell to 0% and they lost $9 billion overnight. So. Then we're left, so, that, so the thiazolidine dion story we know. But what about sulfonylureas, which we know we use in clinical practice? In fact, there are data published in this meta-analysis that show the following. These are all the clinical cardiovascular outcome trials when sulfonylureas have been used. And what you see is this, 33 studies, 1,325,000 patients treated with either sulfonylurea or a comparator. Follow-up, anything from 0.46 to 10.4 years. What did they show? Actually, they showed that the cardiovascular mortality was not decreased, but was increased by 27%. And yet, we either ignore this or we don't read about this. And I think that's important because if we're going to improve the outcomes of our patients, we need to look at this data. So if you are treating people with sulfonylureas, you are potentially increasing their cardiovascular outcomes by 27%. So we have a problem with the current medications. And of course, metformin, which I think actually is a perfectly safe drug, and it's a good drug, um, has GI events, but that does not, it's not kind of a problem because it doesn't increase cardiovascular events. And we know in the UK PDS, in the overweight individuals, it reduced cardiovascular events. But the other therapies, I think we really do have a problem with. And so in our pursuit of lowering glucose, we need to think about what is it that we are dealing with. So the elephant in the room, to me, in relation to these other therapies, is two things. One is, the occurrence of hypoglycemia, which we know occurs with sulfonylureas, which we know occurs with insulin. Um, and we know that in all three studies, there was a three to two-fold increase in hypoglycemic events. The other aspect of these therapies is this. 
And Elliot Jocelyn in 1927, this is only two, four years after the discovery of insulin, said, from an excess of fat, diabetes begins, and from an excess of fat, diabetic patients die. And yet, in our clinical practice, what do we do for our patients? We improve their blood sugar, but we put them on drugs, which causes what? Weight gain. And if you look at the Accord and the Advance and the VADT study, you don't need to be a genius to work out why there were excessive cardiovascular events. Because if you look in the intensive arm of the Accord study, those who gained weight, 30% almost gained more than 10 kilograms in weight. And you tell me, if you have a patient who's already overweight, and you give them medication to increase their weight by 10 kilograms, that this is not going to have an adverse event on cardiovascular outcomes. Of course it is. So really, we have to think long and hard before we put our people, patients on therapies that will cause weight gain. And the same for VADT. Actually, they gained eight kilograms. And we know that different medications have different impacts in terms of weight gain. So sulfonylureas, for example, will you get a two to four kilogram weight gain. Meglitinides get weight gain. Thiazolidines weight gain. Insulin weight gain. It's only the DPV4 inhibitors, metformin, and the GLP-1 receptor agonists where you get weight loss, which is what you want in your patients. So what are these therapies that will are weight neutral or will give you weight loss? Well, we have a choice. You have the oral drugs, DPP-4 inhibitors, or you have the GLP-1 agonists, which are the injectables. And of these, we have a multiple kind of choices, actually. You've got vildagliptin, citagliptin, saxagliptin, linagliptin, alagliptin. All of the gliptins, we know, lower HbA1c by around 0.5 to 1%. But they also either, either weight neutral or you do get some weight loss, one to two kilograms. So I think that's a positive. And of course, on the other side, you have the GLP-1 receptor agonist where you get more HbA1c reduction, one to two percent, but you also have greater weight loss, two to four kilograms. So you have two therapies that potentially can lower glucose, but also lower weight. And of course, the big difference between DP4 inhibitors and the receptor agonist is actually one is it's an oral, the other one is an injectable, but the cost as well and the availability. So let's compare the DPP-4 inhibitors with sulfonylureas because people generally say, well, sulfonylureas are better drugs for lowering glucose than anything else, oral treatment-wise. But if you look at this analysis, recent analysis, what you see is this. HbA1c reduction, actually in the first 12 weeks, was better with sulfonylureas compared to DPP-4 inhibitors. But if you go out to one year and two years, actually there is no difference in HbA1c between, you can see there, between a sulfonylurea and DPP-4. So yes at 12 weeks, no at 52 weeks, and no at two years. So long term, DPP-4 and SGU are actually comparable. But where you have an advantage is this, weight loss. You can see straight away, DPP-4 inhibitors, you have much greater weight loss at 12 weeks, at one year, and at two years in the DPP-4 arm compared to the sulfonylurea arm. And hypos. Actually, again, you have less hypos in the DPP-4 arm compared to the SUs. So we have to start thinking of these drugs, GLP-1 or DPP-4, and even the SGLT-2 inhibitors, of something that will offer us more than just lowering glucose. And we know that there are many potential benefits that can arise from these drugs, and these include cardioprotection and uh, improvements in terms of inflammation, body weight, blood pressure. There are clinical trials that have been published, and of course, we have the DPP-4 inhibitor trials. There were three major trials, which actually 
to me were a little bit disappointing because what we wanted to see is an improvement in outcomes. But we didn't see that. But equally, we didn't see more harm. So I think as an oral therapy, it certainly is better than what we have previously, but it's not an advantage to our patients. Whereas we know from the LEADER study um, and, of course, the SUSTAIN study, that there is definitely a benefit to our patients with the injectables. And, of course, the EMPEREG um, and the other CANVAS studies which have shown improved outcomes. So, if we were to put the DPP-4 inhibitors on this chart, then what actually you would get is something around here. So you would see that there is, not significant, but there is, it's neutral in terms of outcomes. So it certainly is not worse as was found in Accord. But then there are concerns that we've had in terms of DPP-4 inhibitors and heart failure and fractures. Are these concerns something we should consider? Well, for advice, the most recent ESC guidelines tell us the following. In terms of type 2 diabetes mellitus and heart failure, and you, if you look at the therapies that are available, so DPP-4 inhibitors, for example, succagliptin, there is actually, compared to placebo, increase in heart failure hospitalization. But allogliptin and citagliptin, no effect. The, H, the GLP-1 inhibitors, no effect on heart failure hospitalization. And in fact, the SGLT2 inhibitors, you can see, reduced heart failure hospitalization. So overall, these drugs seem to be safe in terms of heart failure hospitalization. Fracture risk, again, a large meta-analysis has shown when you compare DPP-4 inhibitors to other therapies, actually no significant effect in terms of fractures for any of these therapies, when you, whether you compare them to placebo or whether you compare them to um, other active therapies. And this is true for, the ACE, for all the DPP-4 inhibitors. Additional benefits that may arise from the use of DPP-4 inhibitors include the following. You can reduce the insulin dose, actually, in patients who are already on insulin. There is also some work that suggests that it may be beneficial for what is called type 3 diabetes, which is the association between dementia and type 2 diabetes. And there is actually some little early data suggesting that it may have an impact on wound healing. So in terms of DPP-4 inhibitors, what is very clear Every single study that's been done to date shows that if you have a type 2 patient on insulin and you add a DPP-4 inhibitor, you will reduce the insulin dose. And this varies from up to about 10 units of insulin. So that is a, certainly an additional benefit. And I think if weight gain is something that occurs with insulin, you can limit that by putting on a DPP-4 inhibitor. In terms of incretin-based therapies and neurocognitive function, there's actually a recent systematic review which um, suggested that there may be, as a result of, this was actually comparing metformin with vildagliptin and citagliptin, that there may be an improvement in terms of baseline cognitive function in the group that were on a DPP-4 inhibitor after two years. But we, I think we need to see bigger, longer-term studies to prove that this is really something that plays a role. And finally, there is actually, from a theoretical point of view, a role to be played of DPP-4 inhibitors in terms of wound healing. Because dipeptidylipeptase 4 actually is expressed in um, wounds when they are healing. So, in fact, DPP-4 inhibitors, you can see, um, are expressed. DPP-4 actually as a, as a receptor is expressed on fibroblasts on myofibroblasts, and therefore, it could potentially play a role in, in terms of accelerating cutaneous healing, even renal fibrosis, hepatic fibrosis, and um, lung fibrosis. So this is actually work in progress in terms of clinical trials that are being done to look at wound healing, to look at glomerular sclerosis, and to look at hepatic fibrosis. Thank you.